Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 866. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 6th, 2024. All right, welcome to another program where Kevin and George tell you what we think. How could that be exciting? Well, we talk about exciting stuff, whether or not we think excitingly or not. Um, I'm Kevin. That's George. We've been doing this since uh, probably 2009, 2010. This is our 866 episode. We're heading to 1,000. It's just crazy. Why is it crazy? Because there's always a lot of news to cover with the Anglican Church, the Christian Church, the Roman Catholic Church, politics here in America and around the world. It gives us about an hour to sit down and talk once or twice a week to you, the audience. We appreciate you watching us. It means a lot to us. Uh, This whole show is about the audience, not just the news. And I want you to do something for us. If you get a chance and you see a like button on Facebook and YouTube, click that. That fools the algorithm uh, on Facebook and YouTube. It tells them this is a good show, a show they should promote and share. And you should share it too. Share this with friends and foe and any bishop you may know. Uh, What else should you do? Oh, go to the comment section. The show does not end when I click the, uh, the record button off. You need to go to the comment section and tell us what you think about the topics we're talking about. And we got lots of topics that you should be commenting on because we want to know what the audience thinks. That's part of the reason we do this show. George, how are you doing this week? I am doing great. I spent the 4th of July steam cleaning the carpets in the uh, in the house. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> no, just getting back to normal, uh, normal, my wife's home, and uh, just reestablishing routines and... Uh, well, you know, the carpets did need to be cleaned. Well, I don't know if we told people this, but you're doing some renovations at your house. You bought a house last year, and there's there's things that you and Susan want to do. And one of them is yeah, ripping out I, the floors. Yeah, well, I ripped out the floors in the living room and dining room while she was away. And uh, putting down uh, engineered hardwood, uh, remodeling the bathrooms, and uh, been doing drywall and... Uh, Put in a water softener system, all sorts of mechanical stuff that uh, uh, I haven't killed myself yet with a power tool or electrical currents. But <laughs> yet. It's a lot of fun. Sure. It, uh, I, I don't have the money. I don't have the uh, wherewithal to hire contractors, but I have enough uh, saved up each month to buy materials. So and so for here, I got uh, I got a thousand feet of engineered hardware off the back of a truck uh, from somebody. Uh, usually goes for about eight dollars a foot, and I got it for about forty cents a foot. That's weird. So I'm not going to ask where it came from. <laughs> that is weird. I mean, it, it. We're over here, and we just left Idaho. We're in Wyoming. We spent last week visiting uh, Jackson Hole, which is a lot of fun, and that area. Uh, if many Americans probably saw in the news that the Teton Pass was washed out in a rainstorm, the day that they restored that, and you were able to drive over it again, we were there. Uh, a lot of fun and we're still at elevation this is generally about seven thousand feet uh above sea level there's not a lot of oxygen in the air up here but i've been enjoying my my bike rides still and uh it's been a lot of fun so we need to get on with the program next week is yellowstone i forgot to say that um but my sh- george sent me a two pages of notes so this may be a little longer episode unless we talk really fast. We're going to do an Episcopal Church General Convention Roundup. You sent me some uh, notes about the new uh, presiding bishop, Sean Rowe, and how you know you and I have seen what's been going on in the Episcopal Church for the longest time. There's a war going on, a war for the soul of the, uh, the Episcopal Church. And now it seems that war is over. And the conservatives obviously have, have left in mass, and now the new presiding bishop is left to pick up the pieces, George. Yeah. Uh, last Friday, when we were filming, was the closing day of the general convention, and the uh, last minute items were done. And including, and one of the things that had not yet taken place was the presiding new presiding bishop's closing sermon. And it was a very telling sermon. It signaled where he wanted to take the church. Uh, Sean Rowe warned that business as usual cannot continue. 
the church nationally need to be leaner, more focused. That meant we had to get rid of staff and, and vanity projects and programs and focus on the work of church, not the work of social justice and change. Now, these are my words, but this is how I understood him. Sure. Now, in the general convention itself, there was a fight between the bishops and the deputies over these sorts of things. The bishops are in a very realistic mood. For them, the wars are over. There's a live and let live mindset among the majority of bishops so that the handful of uh, out right conservative bishops are not being treated uh, the way they had in the past. Um, a little, little sign. One of my parishioners, member of my parish, was elected to a national church office. She was elected treasurer of the national ECW, Episcopal Church Women. Now, this is the, the first time in my memory that someone from Central Florida has been elected to a national position. Now, she is African American or West Indian, mm -hmm. but she's from Central Florida and she goes to that parish led by that devil incarnate George Conger, yet she still was elected to a national church position. Is this a sign of the times, of a new toleration, or have people been so exhausted by the bloodletting over the years that they just want to get back to work and back to business? But I'm hopefully optimistic that Sean Rowe will, he was elected as a manager. Uh, in the run-up, uh, I predicted a DEI choice, uh, a Hispanic uh -huh. man sure. who was also running, and an African American mm -hmm. man and a and a woman, and a balding, early late middle aged man from Erie, Pennsylvania, was elected, which is really? not a DEI choice by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination. Odd. Uh, and he was he is a man known for his ability to work and get the organization moving. So maybe we're gonna see a good change, I don't know. Maybe generation before things <clears throat> clean themselves up. Well, he went to VTS. Um, and he, he went to Grove City College mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, which is a conservative, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's religious affiliated, but it's a conservative college. Uh, and he went to VTS. He was a uh, other classmate or a year before or a year after Matt Kennedy. Oh, okay. And, so far, we haven't heard any screams of outrage uh, that this is a, a closet, this or that. So let, well, I was disappointed with Michael Curry because his, how he presented himself was one way, but how he actually was, was a different way. Uh, Sean well, Rowe I, I think we as a technocrat. Michael Curry was what we expected. Especially the way uh, Justin Welby touted him out and brought him to a, a wedding over in the UK to, to give some preaching. And uh, he gives wonderful uh, revival sermons based on his belief that the Beatles were the greatest band in history and love is all you need. And I have no further expectations from him, from Michael Curry. Uh, I do praise for his health. Uh, he's he's in retirement now. I hope he gets a nice long sabbatical. But he is kind of what we thought he would be, and he turned out to be that guy. Yeah. yeah. One of the things to close out the convention was that Eastern and Western Michigan dioceses were merged, and they're now going to be called the Diocese of the Great Lakes. Can't do that. Yep. Already got one. Okay. <laughs> so we now have two Anglican Dioceses of the Great Lakes, just uh -huh. like we have two Dioceses of South Carolina and so on. Mm -hmm. The Wisconsin Dioceses were officially merged, so Milwaukee, Fond du Lac, and Eau Claire are no more. It's called mm -hmm. the Diocese of Wisconsin. Micronesia, which is Guam, Saipan, the Mariana Islands, was merged into Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Uh, Navajo land was upgraded to a missionary diocese, meaning it can now elect its own bishop and have, instead of having one appointed, it's still going to need money from the national church. But they were given a bit of a, a, a boost and independence. The uh, trajectory is in consolidation. The trajectory is in uh, clawing back and cutbacks and trying to rebuild and revamp 
uh, the church to what it was 40, 50 years ago. Whether this team can now do it, I don't know. Uh, well, hold on. Okay, you, you rebuild the 40 or 50 years ago. What was the Episcopal Church like 40 or 50 years ago? But go back to 1970, 1960. It was a robust church. Mm -hmm. It was a church that uh, you wanted to know the opinion of the presiding bishop on political matters, on international matters, on church matters. Um, it was a church where, okay, I, I kind of think they did this with the election of Sean Rowe, but your average uh, thought of what an Episcopalian was was somebody who drove a Volvo, lived in the Northwest, and had a Yale, gra uh, Yale graduation. Um, and, you know, is Sean Rowe not that ideal right now? So, I don't Sean know. Rowe is more middle America, mm -hmm. more middle America. He's from Erie. He's not from the mid-Atlantic area. He's not a Yale graduate. He went to Grove City College. In other words, he, he looks more like a Republican politician than he does. Don't do that. A, uh, <laughs> You're going to ruin his career. <laughs> no, well, but uh, so we'll, we'll just see how these things unfold. Mm -hmm. And that's what time is for, to reveal that. Now, um, as a non-Episcopalian, I pray for Sean Rowe. Uh, I pray for his leadership. I pray for the return of the Episcopal Church to the, the, the Christian fold. Um, that's something we, we do as Christians. Uh, we pray, and we honestly seek that there'll be reconciliation one day with the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion and the ACNA. Uh, that's what this is all about. But... We shall see. You have here. Well, let, oh, let, me, let me just, this is a airy fairy thing. Okay. What I see in what has been missing in the national church has been empathy. The general convention is stacked full of narcissists, uh, as have the House of Bishops. Yeah. And empathy is one of the things that disappears when you're a narcissist. The ability to understand the other person and to have sympathy for their position, even if you may not agree with it. What Sean Rowe has demonstrated in his episcopacy and what I think people were voting for was that here is a man who expresses empathy. So he may not, you may not agree with him, but he understands you, the depth of your feeling and he understands your argument. He may not agree with it. Whereas with Michael Curry and Catherine Jefferson Shorey and some of the crazies at General Convention, uh, you're either evil, mentally ill, or uh, stupid if you don't agree with them. And now we've moved to somebody who, well, I disagree with you, but I see the, I see the strength of your argument, but I don't buy it, mm -hmm. which is a different world. It's a different world. I kind of see it differently. I think you, uh, the Episcopal Church just woke up from its hangover and said, we need somebody to fix our problems. And uh, that may be Sean Rowe. We'll still have to see. I, d I don't know his ability for empathy, uh, but I would hope that you're correct in that. Let's move on to the second story. Uh, kindly enough, uh, the office of ACNA has reached out to me and scheduled a interview with the new Archbishop, Steve Wood. Uh, that will occur Monday, and uh, it should be fun. Uh, any topics I should be talking about, George? Yes, I've got a little list for you. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Does he still believe what he wrote during the height of the BLM time? You say wrote. I say co-signed. Co-signed. Okay. Right, right, right. Did uh, non-geographic diocese, women clergy, what's he going to do about the Church of Nigeria in, with their missionary districts in North America? They yeah. may not be dioceses anymore, but they're still here. You know, they're still here. What is his uh, relationship with GAFCON and the Global South going to be like? Uh, he may have attended meetings, but I, he was not uh, prominent in those gatherings. So how will he s get up to speed with that? And we had uh, unrelated news, which is going to affect him deeply, which was Todd Hunter's announced his retirement next year, I believe April 2026. I, th I think it's 2026 is this, well. Well, he, he's, he's announced his, yeah. his coming retirement. Mm -hmm. And one of the people, one of the groups that are hammering him uh, are hammering him because they want action on C4SO. They believe it's a little loosey goosey and not really Anglican and doesn't have as firm a grasp 
of what it means to be in the ACNA as it should. Now, here, Steve Wood has to walk a fine line. A, a C4SO is the largest attendance of any diocese. Um, well, some people say, well, it's not the right sort of people we want attending. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, how do you, how do you trans, how do you bring C4SO into the fold without interrupting or diverting its charism, which is a different sort of diocese. Mm -hmm. Now, you go to a church that's in that diocese. Yeah, I go to a church. Down here. Yeah, well, I, I go to a church in Tampa that is a C4SO church. It's Trinity Anglican. It was planted with the hopes and desire and promise to put it into uh, a Florida diocese under a bishop, uh, an active bishop in Florida. And uh, that's still on trajectory. Nothing there's changed. Um, this church is Anglican. This isn't, it, it, from what we know of some C4, C4SO churches that I've attended and, and went to, this is nothing like that. These are people who are really seeking a liturgical worship um, and are doing a wonderful job in growing a church. And God is so blessing that church with attendance and people's transformed lives. So, you know, we can point at C4SO, C4SO all day. You know, can you just, just rename the diocese? I'm, I, I, but whatever. Okay. And so, um, and say it's all, you know, rot. It's not. God certainly uses Todd Hunter and his diocese to grow the church and change lives. Nobody can deny that. Um, the numbers are there. The people are there. However, there's some squirrely stuff that, you know, uh, we need to hold bishops and dioceses accountable for. Um, thankfully, it doesn't happen at Trinity Anglican. So, I, yeah, I, I get it when people say, oh my gosh, you know, this person is uh, uh, very luminous. I get it. I know. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how they got through. I don't. Um, vetting people is, vetting leadership is the most important job of a bishop and uh, i was at a new wineskins event and talking to a bishop and his biggest complaint was unvetted clergy and uh, yeah I, I get it I, so uh but this also shows a mature um acna they're, they're, they're getting more and more mature as the problems that uh the fringes freak out about the bishops freak out less about you know, so we shall see what happens. Uh, what else did you put in the list of stuff I should talk to Steve? Hey, here. Okay, let, let, let's open this up to the audience. Um, I'm going to be doing an interview with Steve Wood uh, Monday. This gives you plenty of opportunity to go, go to the comments and write questions that you would like to, to me to ask. I don't know if I'm going to ask him or not, but it'll give me a trajectory of what to say and what not to say. And, it, it, and Steve, hopefully he'll be able to read the comments and and know what's coming <laughs> so uh go to and i will know it's a question for steve wood because there will be a question mark at the end of your comment there we go everybody should be happy let's see here um third going over to england now england suffered greatly july 4th 1776 when all of a sudden uh the, the colonists said britain no more we we don't we don't like your taxes we don't like your king um, we, we're going to do this alone. And then July 4th, 2024, they said, hey, we're going all lib. We're, we're going left. We're voting for the left in this and the left in that. And uh, um, they kicked out the conservatives, but they didn't kick out the conservatives because there was really no conservatives there, George. That's not a conservative party that was defeated. That was, uh, we don't know who we are. We're having an identity crisis. And uh, there was no market threats amongst the people who lost George. Well, I, I, uh, I'm leery of getting too deep into British politics because we do have a very large British audience. Yep. Um, it, what, it was not a surprise that the conservatives were voted out of office. They were very unpopular and it's been 14 years they've been in power. Uh, Britain is moving the opposite direction of the rest of Europe, France and Germany. Um, Canada have all are all moving to the right and I expect the United States in the November elections will move to the right mm -hmm. Britain has moved to the left now 
question I have is, is because they're moving against the Conservative Party of uh, the former Prime Minister Sunak, or are they entranced with the Labour's uh, policies? From a church or Christian perspective, you know, there are some Labour leaders who want to get rid of the House of Lords and the Bishop's place in the House of Lords. Uh, so the whole disestablishment uh, business is going, could be raised. Uh, the whole issue of abortion and of transgenderism and of uh, divorce, you know, at the family policies, moral policies. Uh, it, the sad thing is the conservatives were pretty poor on this. It was David Cameron, the conservative who brought in gay marriage. Uh, the, it's been under the conservatives that you've had Stonewall uh, advising the government on children's uh, sexuality and things like that. Uh, from an American perspective, the Conservative Party is not a conservative party. It's a center-left party, but that's an American perspective. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. And the other thing that surprises me is uh, that the, the, the party with the third largest vote total uh, reform had a larger vote total than the Liberal Democrats. But the way the system works is the Liberal Democrats are going to have 10 times the number of seats in parliament is reform. Um, well, that's the system they have and they know how to work their system, but it is not really as representative of the situation on the ground as it could be. Yeah, I, I spent a, a good 10 minutes ex explaining to a relative today how parliament and coalition governments work. That's crazy. Yes, <laughs> no question it's crazy. Uh, you know. We, we're a little different here in America. We're not better, but we are a little different in how we do politics. And um, it, it's, it's strange because if you remember back in, in the early days of Margaret Thatcher, she would say the first thing a politician must do is win the argument. Then you'll get the votes. Um, and the conservatives there have not won any arguments at all. They've, anything the liberals have asked for, they've given them. You know, they, they certainly botched COVID. Uh, you know, this is, this is, here's Kevin's pendulum. Okay. Nice and slow. Uh, but, uh, here, you know, this is, this is, England does it in 14, 15 year increments, uh, where America does in eight year increments. So, uh, here's your, here's your pendulum, uh, to the Brits. So, well, Justin Welby has, uh, released a statement, uh, congratulating, giving his heartiest and warmest congratulations to uh, the new prime minister to be. So the uh, Welby and the House of Bishops have voted in lockstep with Labour for years in the House mm -hmm. of Lords. So they're happy. Um, well, we'll there. see. Uh, I don't have any reports today, but this is the day the uh, the Church of England Synod is meeting. Uh, number one topic is LLF, and uh, they're like six or seven hours ahead of us. So have we he heard anything from today's sessions? Well, today's session is going to focus on a paper being put forward by the Bishop of St. Ed Edmundsbury in Ipswich, which is entitled A Wisdom of Trust, Building and Sustaining Trust in the Church of England. In other words, they want to address the issue, and they're going to be asked to take note of the paper. They're not going to have to do anything about it, but just take note of the fact that people don't trust the Church of England. And the issue is, of, and in their paper, they say, oh, it's all social media and atomization and people breaking down into tribes of conservatives and liberals and this and that. All of that is true, but I do think that the failure of safeguarding, the failure of the lack of transparency from the, transparency from the bishops, the control freakery of Justin Welby, they're not going to make <laughs> trust building trust easy. You can't just say, I want trust. You have to earn trust. And those in power are doing their darndest uh, to see that this doesn't happen, whether intentionally or no. So that's on today's docket. And in the coming days, they're going to basically hit on LLF. Now, in the past few days, Living in Love and Faith, which would put forward uh, blessing services for same-sex marriage, same-sex right. relationships. Well, I, I've seen, you want, you talked about social media. Social media has been where this has been revealed between the Bishop of Oxford and others saying, really, you got the numbers to, to fight this? Come on, show me the numbers. Yeah. yeah the, 
the Alliance, which is a group of evangelically leaning group people, uh, had last earlier in the week, last week, put out a call for a parallel province should LLF come forward. The Bishop of Oxford uh, put out a public document uh, basically saying, well, you guys don't have the numbers uh, that you claim to have and that you've already conceded gay marriage in principle, so why don't you just go along and practice? Um, the society, the Anglo-Catholics are being squishy. They said, we're not going to join the alliance because we already have alternative oversight, but we support in principle what they want to do. You know, thank you very much. Uh, but then, you know, the Alliance pushed back and the Church Society pushed back. And there was an interesting little comment on the Thinking Anglicans website. Pete Broadbent, the former Bishop of Williston, he's retired. He uh, attacked uh, uh, Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, for gaslighting. Uh, now, I still don't know what that word means uh, quite well. But it, Kevin, it, you'll have it, to explain it, it, it to me it, It's blaming you for what you're seeing with your eyes. Uh, oh, you caught me in bed with my secretary. You're not seeing what you're seeing. You know. Well, you know, st uh, well, uh, the the conservatives are saying, look, you know, you're you're saying that marriage doctrine is not going to change, but now we're going to have marriage light type services. How's this not a change? And uh, the bishops who are saying it's not a change, or Pete Broadbent saying they're gaslighting conservatives. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it means. Well, I mean, uh, it, it, when I'm gaslighting you, I'm challenging you to question your own reality. Okay, and that that's the simplest explanation. Let, let me Google it real quick. What does Google say? Hold on, no, 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 this is important. We're, we're entering a realm where we have to use AI and stuff. Here we go. Gaslighting is a form of psycho psychological manipulation in which a person or group makes someone question their own reality, memory, or perceptions. There, there, official term. Okay, so that's all going to be in the coming days. The evangelicals are going to push hard. Uh, the Catholics will see if they sit on their hands or not. Um, but there's certainly not the two-thirds majority in uh, the Synod to implement fully same-sex marriage, but there may be gains in parliamentary trickery and this and that where the bishops can commend something which doesn't make it official but makes it lawful and uh, I don't know. Uh, it's well, but that's the thing. When you get into parliaments and you get into what happens at these synods, all they have to do is go halfway there, and they've arrived. You know, they get what they want. The the you know, sure, it's not the exact uh, technicalities that the the liberals have been uh, wanting, but you got your way. You're going to get your blessings. We're just not going to do it officially. We, we're going halfway for you. Just be happy. And lots of times they are happy. Uh, they would prefer that uh, they go all the way. They'll still complain about it, but they got something. Yeah. Well, this is not on the agenda, but it was addressed in written questions, which the answers were provided in this past week. Finances and attendance are really are in a free fall. Mm -hmm. That's my phrase, but I believe they're in a free fall. Just some of the things I jotted down. Church attendance is down 19% since the pandemics, and it's 29% below 2015. That, it's appalling. Uh, parish incomes are down 14%. Uh, the number of regular givers in 2015 was 538,000. It's just over 400,000 today. 138,000 people who gave no longer give. And those who are still giving, that's 400,000, they're giving less now than they did then. Um, the parish share is down 9%. That's the money sent by parishes to the diocese. And in real terms, inflation just terms, is down 30%. Uh, a horrible statistic is vocations are down 40% since 2019. And that there are only going to be 350 people beginning ordination training this year. And they're expecting a class of 650. That's what would have been normal. That's appalling. Uh, 30 dioceses reported deficits in 2022, and 35 are expected to report deficits in 2023 and beyond. Uh, Luke Appleton, who's a member of Senate, as a friend of this show, he had a question. 
uh, given to the question was has the pledge to give a hundred million pounds in reparations for slavery impacted giving and the church of england responded with a yes and no yes we can't really measure it but certainly has caused psychological problems but it doesn't matter because the money we're going to give will come out of the church commissioner's investments not out of parish income <clears throat> that's well, not how it works <laughs> This, you know, it's like my wife saying, well, I'll use the MasterCard instead of the Visa, and it won't. I still have to pay both cards, but, you know, the, so the wokery and the virtue signaling, uh, for whatever reason, has killed attendance, it's killed income, and now people are saying, I'm not going to give money if they're going to give it away in reparations. Why should I? The church is scrambling to say, oh, well, no, it's coming from another pocket. It's the same pocket. Come on now. Yeah. I, I mean, this all comes out of the out of the end of the day, out of the church's resources. So early on in my career as a journalist here, uh, some people don't think I'm a journalist, but early on <clears throat> as my career as a reporter slash videographer slash guy who runs around with his camera and tripod all over the world, it, it, it became clear to me that who you are as a church is good but who you are identified with with other churches having some type of relationship is even better it makes you more relevant and we have stories floating around uh, since uh, the Anglican provincial uh, meeting in Latrobe that the ACNA has made long strides to uh, cement a relationship with Rome. Uh, so much so that maybe there could be a, t uh, a time in the near future we, where uh, Rome would recognize our Anglican orders. Now, in average, uh, there's 300 people in the audience who are at the core are going, there's no way. Hey, there's, there's too many things that, w that we have to overcome uh, with women's ordination, uh, some of our, our Calvinist bent, to, to even get close to a point where the Pope would say uh, ACNA orders are uh, identifiable within Rome. There's no way. However, um, I, for the last five or six years, had wondered aloud on this program, is Rome a place we want to have a relationship with? Because where are they going to be in 10 or 20 years? You know, certainly now they're, they're on team, they're on side, but they're getting squishy. Squishy to the point the Episcopal Church was in 1998, 1997, that type of squishy. Scary squishy. Do we want to have that, that relationship and to make it uh, something we, we want to achieve and, and vocal about and, and celebrate? And Jules Gomez has written a story about ACNA Rome relations that we need to talk about this, George. Yeah, Jules Gomez had a story out there that's caused a bit of a flap and stir. Um, it implies that recognition of Anglican orders of some in the ACNA is just around the corner. That uh, he recounts the fact that Eric, McNe uh, Eric Meniz, the Bishop of San Joaquin, has mm -hmm. been leading uh, dialogue discussions with the Catholic Church. And some of the things that they're talking about are ways that we can bring the two closer. And the hope one day would be full communion, that we all would be one. Now, the way this article was written implies things that I think are not possibly going to happen. So you're part of the core 300. Okay. Well, what's not, well, not going to happen? <laughs> well, first off, um, Where do you begin? I know. Uh, well, yeah. Well, first we, off, the, we, we've yeah, been separated. You know, we've been separated from Rome for a long time. Okay. And, and well, first off, if this if this even take occurs, mm -hmm. what's it going to say to the people, the ordinary? Uh, this past week, uh, Cardinal Fernandez went to London to uh, consecrate the uh, uh, bishop for the ordinary, and he made it quite clear that the ordinary is here to stay. Mm -hmm. If there are moves to basically say the ordinary is superfluous and we're 
basically going to go and recognize the Anglican orders, or at least some of them, what does it, you know, basically you're slitting the throat of the ordinary. So I, so there are stakeholders in the Catholic world who would say, over my dead body. And, uh, and let's be honest, the ordinariat is successful. Not as successful as Rome had hoped, but more successful than the Anglicans had hoped for, for sure. Yeah. Now, here's the problem in that to recognize Anglican orders, you have to undo a papal bull from the late 19th century, Apostol Apostolic Curie. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are arguing that the church is that the new Roman rites for the Eucharist and for ordination removed some of the problems that were raised over 125 years ago. I just still don't see that happening in that my, within the ACNA, there are varieties of doctrines and theologies of what takes place at the Eucharist. Real presence, real spiritual presence, is it a memorial? There are, you know, different understandings of what is a priest. Is he a presbyter? Is he this and that and the other? And to say that you could make a link with the ACNA when the ACNA doesn't agree on the issue of women's orders. Mm -hmm. It doesn't agree on the issue of what is ha taking place at the Eucharist. It doesn't agree about the charism of priesthood. It doesn't agree on sacraments. Uh, sacraments. Or or auricular confession. Are there yeah. two sacraments? Are there seven sacraments? Mm -hmm. Um, and the ACNA, if it wanted the, you know, Rome is keen on the Petrine primacy and the ACNA would have to basically gut most of the 39 articles, which are part of their identity oh, to maybe, maybe 25 of them to, to, to get there. Mm -hmm. So that I, I don't mean unkind, but this was a clickbait story. This is something to get people to read, but. There's just closer relations are a wonderful thing. Yes. And Eric Meniz is doing a great job trying to bridge these things so that we can do things in common. We can have a common voice on issues mm -hmm. so that Anglicans and Catholics can speak on moral and social and ethical issues with a common voice, be it an abortion or mm -hmm. gay marriage or transgenderism. Those are all important things to work towards closer unity. But for them to say that Okay, the priests in Fort Worth, we now recognize, but the priests in C4SO, we don't because they're women and because they, there's some women and they're squirrely. You know, that's just not how it works. Would it be nice to happen one day? Yes, of course. We want to show unity uh, to the world. Um, and... It, and and also, Kevin, this is not a one way. I mean, with the Fiducian supplicants, the, the whole gay yes. marriage, gay blessing stuff that Francis is pushing and affirming, yeah. you know, the ACNA just left that. They're not, don't, sure, don't want to get tied into somebody who are just joining that, that issue. I don't know. You know, I think Jules certainly hit on the nerve that this is something we would all desire the church to become one. Um, and, uh, I, you know, yeah, you know, we'll have to see, uh, keep it in your prayers, but, uh, it, it, most of our audience isn't going to know what the Petrine, we're doing definitions today. Uh, it, you don't have to use Google. Tell me what the Petrine office is, George. Well, that's the papacy, the Pope, the office of Peter, the successors mm. of St. Peter. Yeah. Um, which we don't have a magisterium. That, yeah. Well, we do have a magisterium, but we don't have it identified in, in a person in a person or an institution yeah. uh, we have the consensus of opinion. well that, let's not go down that road but to be a cat to be a roman catholic means to be in communion with the see of peter and you can't be a roman catholic on your own terms you have to be it on the on the church's terms it's just like you can't be an anglican or an episcopalian and say well i'm going to believe this but not that it just doesn't work that way now, I'm sure people make these claims, and I'm sure there are plenty of crazies out there in the Episcopal Church who believe anything. But, you know, let's just put them to one side. Let's talk about real people uh, or, or sensible people. You cannot dictate to a, par to a potential partner what they have to accept in you. You have to accept each other. 
Okay. We'll see. All right, let's 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 talk about uh, a place you and I have been in a foreign land uh, together covering news. And uh, we were there for a GAFCON, too. And in flew Justin Welby, massive big celebrity, to address GAFCON, too. And he gave one sermon in the morning, and people go, what the hell was that? He gave another sermon in mid-morning, and people go, oh, that's okay. That's He's on team. And uh, that's when you and I learned there's two sides of Justin Welby. <laughs> Right there in Kenya, Nairobi, at the cathedral. We gave a quick news update last year, last week, that uh, there's violence happening in Kenya because the government wants to raise taxes. The president was on board with that, and people were killed in violence in the streets. That violence also broke out into the cathedral where um, uh, the police lobbed in grenades and tear gas and shot people. Nobody died, George, but what's the latest? Well, there's been a lot of violence and protests in Nairobi. Uh, And it started off with tax protests, and the government quickly reversed course. But it's now morphed into a protest against the elites, against the deep state in Kenya, against the that small group of people who run the levers of government who are getting richer and richer, more powerful, while the rest of Kenya gets poorer and poorer. The Dean of All Saints Cathedral opened the cathedral to the protesters, and so they had some meetings there. And the police stormed it, lobbed tear gas into the conference rooms that uh, you and I attended. Uh, shots were fired, and the dean, you know, on he had a YouTube video holding little ex- shell casings from that courtyard where we had tea. Fortunately, they didn't hit anybody, but uh, at Parliament Building, ten people were shot and killed. Uh, at the presidential palace and people were killed. Um, the We saw a seismic shift in England yesterday where people wanted to throw the bastards out of office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these were the Conservative Party. In France, they want to throw Macron out of office. He's a liberal. In Germany, they want to throw he's the liberals all but out. Gone. Okay, he's all but gone. He's all but okay. gone. Yeah. Kenya, they want to throw it. And in the United States, the MAGA mindset is throw them out Mm -hmm. of office and so we're seeing this across the board and now from nairobi to donald trump holding massive rallies in the bronx and and uh that bring out more people than local democratic politicians we're seeing there's a change in the air and uh in england it took a strange form of moving left but we'll see how see how that develops it's a strange form, but people always seek change. It's our human nature. We're never satisfied. There were Reagan Republicans who were never satisfied with Reagan. He never went far enough. You know, there's you know liberal Democrats that never thought Obama went far enough. And, um, you know, they, they keep seeking change. And we do, too. Even as Christians, we keep seeking change. It, it is our nature. It's probably not the best part of our nature, but it certainly made us frontiersmen to come out here in America and settle the West. Let's move on to China. Um, You have China laws down the law to religion. China has made Anglican Unscripted, we talked about, because they uh, showed up at the Global South. They were invited, uh, and um, we were a little concerned because you do know (laughs) that that church is controlled by the Chinese government. And here we have confirmation of all that george let's talk about the meeting they had june 26 in china between all the religions on in peking now i'll pause for a second some people like to say it's beijing well that's the communist party's way of describing it the kuomintang the nationalists call it peking and i grew up and i was educated and trained to say peking and i am happy to say peking it's a political statement. It's like saying Persia versus Iran um, or Ukraine and the Ukraine. It Both are political ways of speaking. So if I say Peking, it's not out of ignorance. It's just how I was trained. You rebel. <laughs> well, in Peking on June 26th, the leaders of the five official religions in China, those are the religions recognized by the government. Those are Protestant Christians, Catholic Christians, Buddhists, Muslims and Taoists. Those five groups, their their hierarchies met with Xi Taofeng, who's a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, 
and a minister of state. And in his speech, and I wrote down a quote, Sinicization of religion is the only way to actively guide religions to adopt a socialist society. In a social society, there's no room for non sinicized religions. <laughs> They're a threat to social harmony and progress and will be eradicated. Okay, so. Sinicized religion. Okay. okay, and you have to tell, there's another definition here. Sinitize is a very Chinese word. Meaning religion with Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. The government has said that to be a lawful religion, you have to adapt Christianity to a Chinese environment, which means the Chinese Christians must be subservient to the Communist Party. Their religious faith and doctrines must be in conformance with Chinese policies, party policies and dictates, and if not, they will be eradicated. Now, last, last time we raised this issue, what does this mean? You are justified by works, meaning works that are approved by the party. You are not saved by Jesus Christ or anything like that. Uh, salvation alone, by work, you know, faith or things of that nature. Nor are you saved by good works as a treasury of merit in heaven, uh, an old time Catholic thing. You are saved by works that are listed by the Communist Party. And this is going to be a tremendous problem. This is bad news for the churches in Hong Kong. The Anglican Church in Hong Kong is going to have to conform. It's going to have to change its doctrine. It's going to have to change its discipline. It's going to have to basically recreate itself if it is going to remain a lawful entity by conforming in all things to the party. Uh, the house church movements, they have been persecuted because they're not registered. Now they will be persecuted because they're not registered and they're treasonous because they teach things that are contrary to the Communist Party. And meanwhile, this is whom this official church, whose leaders met with the uh, Central Committee on June 26th, the leaders of this group, Three Self Patriotic Movement, China Christian Council, they were at GAF, at Global South, and the Global South wants to get closer and closer to them. There's problems here, problems here. This is not a, this is a heretical Christian group. Yeah. Well, we've arrived now to the point where, um, you know, China has adopted social credit. You know, that you as a citizen uh, uh, obtain rights and privileges based on how you operate within our society and are viewed by the party. And when you uh, walk outside those norms, like in a church uh, that serves somebody besides the party, you lose social credit within our society. You're less likely to be able to travel from region to region within China. You certainly won't be able to travel with a passport outside of China or send your kids to an American university or to a European university. And these are long-term uh, issues that the church has to um, consider. Now, a Christian church uh, throughout history has always operated best uh, without government controls, has always operated best under persecution, has always grown under persecution. The freer the church, the less likely it, it is to grow. It's sad, you know, but, you know, that's just the reality of church history. So, George, what do you think is going to happen here? Are they going to uh, kowtow? I hate to say that, but, you know. Well, that's what the word means. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're going to see is we're going to see faithful Christians martyred and persecuted and arrested. Mm -hmm. We'll see people move underground, and we will see people go along to get along. Now, when I say heretical, I don't mean the entire three-self church. I mean, his top leaders, mm -hmm. the average per pastor, uh, you know, in a Chinese town or village, you know, he is as orthodox and Christian as they come. But it's going to be like Russia during the Stalin era, where the hierarchy is corrupted and the regular rank and file clergy and leaders basically nod their heads, go, yes, 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 but then go and do what they're going to do. But we now live in a time of uh, cameras everywhere, social credits, and can they get away with 
that passive disobedience and disagreement. Yeah, I mean, whatever the answer is, we have to pray for the we ha we have to pray for these Chinese Christians who are going to be under a degree of persecution that is almost Orwellian, uh, the George Orwell 1984 world. The uh, my other favorite George. Well, it is Orwellian now because. In reality, George Orwell, in his idea that a TV could look back on you, that, that technology never existed when he wrote the book. Now, we're there. There are more cameras in, in the uh, civilized population of China than anywhere else. London, of all places, is, making a, is the second largest uh, adaption of uh, cameras, uh, closed-circuit TV to follow its citizens. Um, this is the dystopian George Orwell. So, but let's talk. Hey, we got like five more minutes here. Let's do a quick talk about American politics. A lot has changed in the atmosphere since we. Is that you? Somebody's beeping you over there. Yes, yeah, that's fine. I'm being asked. I'm being asked whether I need a uh, extension of my car warranty. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yes. Uh, American scams. Okay, so let's uh, quickly talk about some American politics. Uh, Biden had a tete-a-tete uh, uh, -tete -tete debate with Trump, and clearly, you know, Biden wasn't up to his, his skills as a debater that night. It looked bad, um, and he's been playing uh, uh, political um, cleanup since then, and his advisors have too. Sadly, every time he goes into public, he's repeating these types of uh, faux pas, and it, it, he's not able to to reset the narrative. Trump hasn't really had to set the narrative because we all saw what happened. Uh, even though the White House uh, the next Tuesday said there's nothing wrong there. No, he, he had a cold. Um, he's just a little tired from a trip he took two weeks ago. And... This is no different than politics has ever been here in the United States. All presidential elections have been very contentious. Uh, you know, I think, who's the only guy who, Monroe, basically ran uncontested. Other than that, this is just politics here in America. Uh, we have a two-party, uh, two-and-a-half-party system, and it gets really ugly. And this is no different than uh, Lincoln and his opponent, Douglas, no different than anything we saw in the, in the mid-50s and 60s, except that we have a much more liberal press. Everything Biden has done is a victory. Everything Trump has done is done by Satan. And, you know, do you disagree, George? Uh, well, I have to be careful because I have uh, supporters of both sides in my congregation. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, sure I, I didn't take a where. side. I didn't take a side. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure people know what side I come down on based over years of viewing. You'd be surprised if yeah. I didn't think a certain way. One thing that really struck me, though, was that Michelle Obama, I think, definitively has taken herself out of contention. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, she said, you know, she, she's not interested, doesn't want to do it. And then she's, and people say, oh, well, maybe, you know, she's just playing coy. But she said something, the one statement that you can't walk back. She said that she does not want to run for president because she doesn't have it in her soul. She doesn't have that fire that she needs to do it. Now, that, you can't walk back. You can't walk that back. So Michelle Obama has taken herself out of contention. If she said it wasn't time, she wasn't ready, she needed to, you know, there are lots of ways to say no while uh, saying yes. But that was the one thing that's not in her soul to do it, that takes her out. So I, I think my guess is that Joe Biden is going to be the nominee or Kamala Harris. I just don't think that they're going to be able to swing anybody else. Yeah, I mean, all we, I think if there's one more big public slip up from Biden, um, Kamala will uh, certainly be the nominee. My question is, does he make it to November? Do they do uh, Article 25 um, and get him out? Or because uh, he has not had a non coherent, non teleprompter uh, video segment where you're like, did he just say he was the first? 
black female president vice president i don't know just see yeah. <laughs> well we're, we're told that his two closest advisors are his wife and his son hunter oh there you go and <laughs> they are te and they are adamant that he must stay the course now we well, can uh, say stop, stop 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 hunter needs a pardon so hunter's a yes jill uh biden needs somebody to mother she's a yes his daughter is still suffering and, and gets therapy for the, the shower she had to take with her father. That she's a yes. So this, your close family, I don't think, is your best uh, uh, regulator in this, George. Well, what the, the press is now turning against him, uh, the, 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 the press that had been covering for him, Washington Post, CNN, New York great, Times. Great lady, yeah. Yeah, they've they've basically now broken with with Biden, but not with the Democrats. And what they're saying is that Biden is cloistered from everybody, that uh, he do, he doesn't. Uh, it better not be the DNC. <laughs> no, that he doesn't take. Uh, he's basically kept on ice, and he's capable between ten a.m. and. 4 p.m. and his well, his aides and advisors are running the show. Well, he ran he ran as president from the basement last time, so you know it. I mean, I think most people know how biased the press is. There should be really no surprise here. Uh, our European viewers know how you know the BBC is. Uh, you know we have the equivalent PBS here, but we got CNN. C it, I can list. You know, fifteen different uh, journalist out posts that are completely left, not even moderate, and probably three or four uh, moderate to conservative uh, news outposts that I trust. And you know, that's that's really sad for uh, journalism. Well, I, 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 because this is an unprecedented time, I don't know what's going to happen. Who the nominees will be. Sure. I mean, Robert Kennedy has said to the Democrats, you know, pick me. Uh, and well, the uh, Clyburn, uh, Congressman Clyburn from uh, South Carolina, who was uh, one of the co-chairs of the Democratic Party and Kamala Harris's big, big booster, it just was on TV saying that delegates that are committed to Joe Biden are not legally committed. They're only morally committed. So if they believe that Joe Biden is unable to fill that office, they can, it, using their moral conscience, switch to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So there's so much going on that I don't, I can't even begin to guess what may happen, but I can take it locally or statewide. Sure. And that is that Florida will be even more continuous tra trajectory of being even more conservative, even more as the opposite of California in its policies and its politicians. I, I'm currently in a state that is more conservative than Florida, but we don't have beaches here. So, you know, F Florida itself is a, a, a wonderful place, more dynamic uh, politics to say the least. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is going to make uh, those states who are moderate to conservative more um, desirable for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that there are Texas Democratic congressmen who are calling from Biden because, you know, they could lose. Yeah. But you're not seeing people from uh, New Jersey or New York or California calling for Biden to drop down. From well, the that's the side. that's the biggest thing that people are forgetting about is coattails. Uh, when somebody wins big, uh, like a Reagan did, uh, there's many people who get on side and on team and into office because they follow his coattails. Uh, and if Trump wins by seven or eight points, uh, which is the latest prediction, uh, you're going to repopulate the Senate with conservatives and repopulate uh, the uh, uh, House of Congress with, with uh, a conservative voice as well. And, and those conservatives are will be Trump loyalists. Mm -hmm. Trump's yeah. first term, the Republican establishment hated him. He was, you know, 
uh, Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, yeah, Paul Ryan in Congress, yeah. they basically were as much the opposition as with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Those Republicans who will come out on top in November, if things hold and we do get a Republican landslide, will be indebted to Donald Trump. And so Donald Trump will basically be able to set the agenda. Yeah. Uh, deport 25 million people, get rid of income taxes and tips on uh, taxes on tips for waitresses, uh, things of that nature. So politics for me when I was in 30 year old was all anxiousness, um, all, uh, I, you know, it was horrible. Uh, now that I'm in my late 50s, I find politics more fascinating. I don't get anxious by it. If my guy doesn't win, I've isolated my life financially enough that the uh, who's out, ever out there to get me can't get me. Um, so, uh, but boy, when I was 30, I remember Bush Gore and the, the Chads. I had an anxiety attack for two weeks, George. Yeah. I, en I enjoy it as entertainment. I yeah. really do because maybe because of my vocation or my interest, but maybe because I'm a conservative Episcopalian, and a bit of a, an oxymoron, mm -hmm. I just have to trust in something other than men and institutions. I just sure. have to trust in God yeah. that men will fail me, institutions will fail me. Uh, I look at the things that were important in my life as a youngster, you know, universities, the professions, the army, the government, you know, I, I even applied to the CIA when I was in college and all this and that. All of those things, all everyone from Yale University on down have just been massive disappointments, the Episcopal Church and so on and so forth. And all that I can trust in is God. Mm -hmm. And as the older I get, the more deeply I cling to that, that my only, my only hope is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let me read that verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 866 of Anglican Unscripted.